everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. I am excited to announce that we're gonna be doing a three video series about the most devastating accidents in space. The first one, we're actually gonna be talking about the Apollo 1 fire. Because spaceflight is so normal to us, it's easy to forget that astronauts put their life on the line every day. Even a test that never leaves Earth can result in a horrible accident and a loss of lives. Although these stories are awful, keep in mind these disasters also saved life because they shed light onto issues that we needed to fix. Definitely hard to think about. But we'll be discussing what these incidences were and why it happened. So let's get started. Let's get started with something near and dear to my heart, the Apollo 1 fire. I truly connect to the story because my grandfather, as you know, was on Apollo 14. And because of this disaster, all Apollo missions became safer. These men are heroes. Who knows how many lives they've saved. My grandfather was actually the Capcom for this test. I know how deeply it affected him and it did the entire Apollo community. So let's start with who was on board and what the mission was. Apollo 1 was the first crewed mission of the US Apollo program. The astronauts were Gus Grissom, Edward, Ed, H. White, and Roger Chafee. Apollo 1 was planned to be the first low Earth orbital test of the Apollo Command and Service Module scheduled to launch on February 21st, 1967 but that never happened. On January 27, 1967, on launch pad 34, the Apollo 1 crew was performing a plugs out test to determine whether the spacecraft would operate nominally on simulated internal power while detached from all cables and umbilicals. Passing this test was critical to making the scheduled February 21st launch date. This test was considered non-hazardous because neither the launch vehicle nor the spacecraft were loaded with fuel or cryogenic and all pyrotechnic systems were disabled. At one o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time, the crew entered the command module fully suited and were strapped into their seats and hooked up to the spacecraft's oxygen and communication systems. Then Grissom, the command pilot, immediately started to notice a strange odor in the air circulating through his suit, which he compared to sour buttermilk. And the simulated countdown was put on hold at 1.20 PM. While air samples were taken, no cause of the odor could could be found and the countdown then resumed at 2.42 p.m. Three minutes after the countdown was resumed, the hatch installation was started. The hatch, and this is very important to the story, consisted of three parts. One, a removable inner hatch, which stayed inside the cabin. Two, a hinged outer hatch, which was part of the spacecraft's heat shield. And three, an utter hatch cover, which was part of the boost protection cover enveloping the entire command module to protect it from aerodynamic heating during the launch and from launch space rocket exhaust in the event of a launch abort. The boost hatch cover was partially, but not fully, latched into place. After the hatches were sealed, the air in the cabin was replaced with pure oxygen, two PSIs higher than atmospheric pressure. There was a stuck microphone, which was a problem in the communications loop connecting the crew operations to the checkout building. This was very frustrating to Grissom. He even said, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? The simulated countdown was put on hold again at 5.40 p.m. while attempts were made to troubleshoot the communications problem. All countdown functions up to the simulated internal power transfer had been successfully completed by 6.20 p.m. But at 6.30, the count remained at hold at T minus 10 minutes. The crew members were using the time to run through their checklist again when a momentary increase in AC bus two voltage occurred. Nine seconds later at 6.31.04 PM, one of the astronauts yelled, hey, fire, hey, fire, or flame. This was followed by two seconds of scuffling sounds through Grissom's open microphone. This was immediately followed at 6.31.06 by someone believed by most listeners and supported by laboratory analysis to be Chafee, saying, we've got a fire in the cockpit. After 6.8 seconds of silence, a second barely garbled transmission was heard by various listeners as, they're fighting a bad fire, let's get out, open her up. We've got a bad fire, let's get out, we're burning up or, I'm reporting a bad fire, I'm getting out. These transmissions lasted 5.0 seconds and ended with a cry of pain. Whew, that is horrible. The intensity of the fire fed by pure oxygen caused the pressure to rise to 29 PSI, which ruptured the command module's inner wall at 631. Flames and gases then rushed outside the command module through open access panels to two levels of pad service structures. Intense heat, dense smoke, and ineffective gas masks designed for toxic fumes rather than heavy smoke hampered the ground crew's attempts to rescue the men. There were fears that the command module had exploded or soon would, and that the fire might ignite 
ignite the solid fuel rocket in the launch escape tower above the command module, which would have likely killed nearby personnel and possibly would have destroyed the entire pad. As the pressure was released by the cabin rupture, the connective rush of air caused the flames to spread across the cabin beginning in the second phase. The third phase began when most of the oxygen was consumed and was replaced with atmospheric air essentially quenching the fire, but causing high concentrations of carbon monoxide and heavy smoke to fill the cabin and large amounts of soot to be deposited on surfaces as they cooled. It took five minutes for the pad workers to open all three hatch layers and they could not drop the inner hatch to the cabin floor as intended. So they pushed it out of the way to one side. Although the cabin lights remained lit, they were first unable to find the astronauts through the dense smoke. As the smoke cleared, they found the bodies and I'm not gonna go into all of that because it's absolutely horrible. Um, yeah. <laughs> The review board identified several major factors which combined to cause the fire and the astronaut's death. An ignition source probably related to vulnerable wiring carrying spacecraft power and vulnerable plumbing carrying combustible and corrosive coolant. A pure oxygen atmosphere at higher than atmospheric pressure, a cabin seal with a hatch cover which could not quickly remove at high pressure, an extensive distribution of combustible materials in the cabin, inadequate emergency preparedness, rescued or medical assistance, and crew escape. Manned Apollo flights were suspended for 20 months during the command module's hazards were addressed. However, the development and uncrewed testing of the lunar module LM and Saturn V rockets continued. The first successful crewed Apollo mission was flown by Apollo 1's backup crew on Apollo 7 in October 1968. The Apollo 1 fire really affected the Apollo program. The manned Apollo flights were suspended for 20 months while the command module hazards were addressed. However, the development of uncrewed testing in the lunar module LM and Saturn V rocket continued. The first successful crewed Apollo mission was flown by Apollo 1's backup crew on Apollo 7 in October 1968. All in all, the Apollo 1 fire was catastrophic and terrible, but I do think that these three men as missed as they are, did save lives of many Apollo astronauts that came after them by pointing out fundamental flaws in the development of space travel. All right, everyone, I know that was a rough video to get through. That Apollo 1 fire left a deep impact on me, as I'm sure it did with everyone in the space community. Make sure that you like and, like and subscribe to this channel for the next two videos. We're actually gonna be talking about Vladimir Komarov in the next video.